there were days where I would I would go to the to the bathroom just to go and cry a bit between between scenes, right? But there were also very supportive people. You know the older actors who are accomplished, the ones that you are so scared to be on set with because they are award winning. They've done international work. I mean, it's just so intimidating. They they are the ones that were extremely supportive. <laughs> The jump. Uh, tap when I speak, all uh, cap with the speech till they caught up in the rapture. I'm so out of line with the phrase game. Let's take a break, been a long day. Hit your line with your fall through with the light sticks. Maybe help me spark the ideas. We got nowhere else to go, it's only up from there. I've been on my own, just running through the fields. Say, vivid for the ears, I know that's how they like. Yeah, I fantasize. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the A1 with Moi. I am so excited about today's guest. She was one of the speakers at the TikTok Rising Voices panel discussion recently. She's an award-winning director, actress, script writer. She has been in this industry, in this entertainment media industry for over a decade. And by the title, I know you already know who I'm talking about. And that is Mabatu Munso. Now, I am extremely excited for you to hear this conversation. In this episode, we talk about how she was able to make her way into the media industry, how she was very intentional about becoming a director, her thoughts about creatives and finance and COVID and the American project she's currently working on. It is such a good episode. I hope you love it. If you do, let me know. Tag me at Moy the A1. Also, if you're listening to this on the podcast, and if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts specifically, give us a review. I'd love to know what you think. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. So that's it for the intro. I hope you love this episode. And if you do, let me know. Enjoy. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your, I'm sure, incredibly busy day to be part of this interview. It's so great to chat to you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to having this conversation as well. It's only a pleasure. Yeah. Now, you recently spoke at the Rising Voices panel discussion about the journey of a Black creator and how to break bound barriers and how to break barriers in the industry as a person of color. What were some of the key takeaways for those of us who weren't at that specific exclusive conversation? But what are some of the key takeaways that you took from it, especially being somebody who's been in this decade for in this industry for over a decade? but also talking to this new wave of creators being TikTokers. Okay, so how, how the workshop played out was that there were three uh, panel speakers um, and then uh, the, the selected people were, were kind of um, sending comments, you know, on, on, on the platform. But what, what came out of, I think, all the speakers was that it's important to know yourself uh, what you're about, uh, why you're doing the content that you're doing. Um, it's important to hone your craft, really work on your craft, um, scale up as much as possible, and to understand your audience so that the work that you're creating is not just successful by fluke, but because you understand um, their appetites in relation to what you have to say as a content creator. Now, you are an award-winning filmmaker, director, you're an actress, script writer, you have your own production company, um, you've been on hit shows like Generations, Rhythm City, Happiness is the Four Letter Word. Can I just say I'm super excited for the second installment of that coming soon? I'm, really I'm not in the second that. installment. Uh, just let me just put it out there. But yeah, looking, looking forward to seeing it too. Oh my God, you just broke my heart. You just broke my heart. Okay, okay, we'll survive. It's okay, it's okay. But has this always been the dream to be this, you know, award-winning filmmaker and director and just be in this industry like that? Uh, yeah, my dream was always to be a filmmaker, specifically writing and directing. Um, so, yeah, what I'm doing right now is definitely a dream come true for me. That was always the plan. How did you kind of start in it? Did you know in the beginning that this is exactly what you wanted to do? Because sometimes we want to be in the industry and we think we want to be one thing. And as we develop in the industry, we realize, you know what, this is what I love. So as far as I know, you didn't necessarily study um, film in the beginning, like right at the start. So 
did you did that decision about becoming a director start early on or as you kind of grew within the industry? Um, I knew since high school that I wanted to be a director. Um, I, I was about 14 um, when I knew for sure that what I wanted to do was directing. I also knew that I wanted to be a writer. Um, it's, it's something that I spoke about with my uh, high school English teacher. She, she liked my writing when we were doing essays. She thought I should become a journalist, um, but I, you know, I knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker and deal specifically with, with stories. So I've, I've always known. Um, I started with acting because that's what I had access to at the time. Um, I did uh, acting in drama in primary school. So, I mean, I, I, I had the tools to do it, but I knew that ultimately what I wanted to do was to create um, the content as a writer and director. So I, I, I have always known. Wow, that's, that's actually amazing because I think sometimes people get confused as to what exactly a director does. Like we, it, it seems like a fancy title sometimes and it's like, you know, we, you know, that's like a dream for a lot of people in the industry in filmmaking, but to actually understand what a director does is a different thing. So for those listening, cause I know we have a lot of up and coming creatives, can you define a little bit as a director, what you do? Okay, so as a director, you basically oversee um, and come up with the vision of the project. You get a script, which is like a blueprint uh, from, a, from a writer. And if you're a writer, director, uh, like myself, sometimes that script is written by you. And that's when you have to separate yourself from, from the writing and think as a director. So once you've got this blueprint, you have to create the vision. What are the colors? What, what will the world look like? What will the performances of the actors look like? What kind of cinematographer do you want to work with? The tone, the mood. Um, so basically, you have to think of everything and then uh, work with the different head of departments to make sure that vision uh, comes true. So um, you'll work closely with the cinematographer, the person who's you know working on the camera, filming the thing. Um, You'll cast actors, you look for actors, audition them, look at the kind of performances you'd like and guide those performances to reach, you know, the vision that you're looking for. There'll be um, art directors, you know, the people who are overseeing the furniture, the, the clothes, the fashion, everything, you know, that's within the frame. There'll be costume designers who are looking after what the characters are wearing, um, makeup, all of those people you have to lead them to say, okay, this is the vision, um, and, and, and you lead that vision, basically. And then in the end, you sit in post with the editor, and you cut, you cut the film. So you are there from the minute you get the script in your hands. You make uh, all the major decisions. Um, and this doesn't mean you, you pick every T-shirt, every nail color polish, but you, you, you give the overall vision, and each person who's the head of department in the different departments is also a talent in their own right. They will uh, do presentations, they'll show you what they have in mind, and you, you, you take the ship to the harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Is that making oh, sense? So you I'm really are sense. involved in every nook and cranny. No, it makes perfect sense. And I love the way you, you broke it down because it showed like how involved in terms of yeah, how involved you are in each aspect to make sure that that full picture comes to life. And I know in the beginning, I believe after high school, you like opened a fashion business, um, you're an actress, because in hindsight now, do you see how it, like all those little aspects of what you've been doing obviously has had input now into you becoming a director. Did you see it at the time you owning your fashion business and you being an actress and some of these big platforms, um, did you always know that it would just always come together the way it did? Um, to a large extent, yes. Um, I think I did. Uh, with, with the fashion business, I didn't incorporate it, so I, I didn't think it would... That's what I didn't think would uh, kind of make an impact because I, I was doing that to survive. I was fresh out of high school. I started a business... Um, I didn't want to sit at home doing nothing. Um, so, so, so that's how that came about. It, it was really a survival move. move. Um, but yeah, in hindsight, I do appreciate um, 
how you know how I understand the the telling story through through wardrobe and through fashion because even when you're doing like a sort of catalog you have to think of the story of these characters where they're from where they're going why they styled the way they are so yeah that's the only thing I didn't see you know that oh okay that played a role but I also did fine art um, throughout school so I knew that that was helping me to think in frames to understand uh, the importance of lighting how it can change a mood and a tone um, and then as an actor listen from day one when I stepped onto set I knew I was coming to be a director so that I always paid attention you know when on every single set that I was on I paid attention to what's going on why did this director's scene work versus that director's scene didn't work why does this camera shot work versus that one so as an actor I was always observant of those things because I knew uh, where I wanted to end up yeah now did you study anything within the film aspect like at uni or any of that so when I got out of high school um, I wanted to do audiovisual multimedia so I did about a semester of that before I had to drop out for financial reasons um, and then that's when I started the, the fashion business and then later on when I was now ready to full on do the transition from acting to directing I went to do a filmmaking course um, at New York Film Academy at the, at the LA uh, studios because I wanted to see uh, Universal Studios and be able to shoot some stuff there um, and then I did later on I did uh, my master's in script and screenwriting so when I was able to afford it, yes, I absolutely did go to school and study um, my trade. I, I love the fact that obviously the financial higher education in South Africa, around the world, it's really around the world, is expensive. And sometimes people feel like they are at a disadvantage if they can't go to these creative schools, especially because the creative schools are generally a little bit more expensive. You have portfolios, you have this and that but you were still able to break through. You kept going, you kept working. Um, and then, like you said, the second you went on set as an actress, because the aim was always to be a director, that became your school. That became, I'm gonna start studying these guys. It became a learnership. Um, for, because I know we're gonna, I'm gonna ask, have questions about this, but getting into that acting, transitioning from, um, the fashion to acting, how did that work out for you? Yeah, okay, so my sister signed me up to a casting agency. Um, I think I was still in high school. Um, and then, yeah, so it, the fashion business and the acting just kind of collided. So because my sister um, had, you know, signed me up to this casting agency, I, I was used to doing auditions right uh, because i knew that okay i don't have the education to go in in the through the technical department but i do have i've done drama so i'm gonna go this route right um and in, in terms of doing drama it's those things of community drama uh high school primary school so it's not always like the official like school you know what i mean but just finding spaces where people are doing what you're interested in and then um, I was doing this, this fashion thing and we were going to print T-shirts. And there was uh, this woman, um, Sandy Wekoroche, she was uh, a big star like on, on, on Generations. And she was moving from acting to fashion, right, at the time. And we happened to be going, we went to the same like mutual friend who was also a designer of, of Abandu Apparel. And she was showing us how to do these silk screening processes so we happened to all meet that day in that in at her place at this mutual friend's place and then she asked me stand away she asked me um don't you want to act and i'm like yeah how did you know because I, I was the quiet one in the room <laughs> you know so it was quite interesting that she picked me of everybody in the room so i'm like yeah and she's like there's these auditions at generations um uh, call them and tell them you want to you wanna audition. So I was like, okay, cool. Uh, I, I made the call and, and they were like, okay, cool, we'll fax you the script. And I'm like, I don't have a fax. Oh, we'll email it to you. Or, well, and then I'm like, no, let me just come in. I'll come and collect the script, you know. Um, 
and I wanted to be in, in the space. I was like, there's no way I'm passing up this opportunity to at least pass through the doors, whether I get this role or not, you know? About three months and about, I don't know how many rounds, it was countless rounds of auditioning uh, to, get, to get the gig. And eventually, yeah, I, I, I got the gig. Oh my gosh, after three months, I'm sure there was a sense of relief. <laughs> It was grueling because we, we did the round of auditions um, and then we had to start over. So they called more people. So it, it's like, I, I, I was like, okay, this is not going to happen. But um, when I went in there and you're seeing all these stars auditioning for this role and you're this nobody, uh, this newcomer, you know, you don't have the, the official qualifications. It can be quite daunting, but... I, I just thought to myself, okay, that's my superpower. My superpower is that I'm new, I'm fresh, I'm raw. You know, I, I psyched myself up. So by the time that call came, shoo, it was like um, I've, I've, I've summited Everest or something. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure it was an incredible feeling. So now you're an actress, you're on huge platforms. A lot of people could have just said, Ah, why, why move? Why change? Why be a director? You're, you know, this is great. The, the country loves you. You're on the biggest shows in the country. But obviously you had a goal to become a director. During that time, was there any time where you felt like, maybe I should just continue acting? Or you were just like, nope, this is my school. I'm becoming a director. Yeah, I am not I mean, budging from this. And it, nobody it happened else exactly the way me. you say um, every time I walked into a room to be like, okay, I'd like to, it was like, we've got this role for you, <laughs> you know? Um, that, that happened a lot because I did the transition sort of at the height of, of the acting work. Um, but you know when you want to do something, man, it, it just gets to that point where you, you can't not do it anymore, no, no matter what sacrifices you have to make. I mean, people sat me down, tried to talk sense into me, um, but I, I had reached that point where I was like, okay, I, 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 have, I have to be a director now. Um, it, it, it has to happen, it's that, it's that simple. And then when you do start, when, when I did finally start getting directing jobs, it was, it was really difficult um, convincing you know some of the people that you used to work with as an actor to take you seriously as a director so there were those moments where it was like what have I done <laughs> you know um I think the first year at least the first year and a half was was brutal it, it was painful yeah in in unimaginable ways like psychologically emotionally you know and financially you have to take um, a pay card, you know, to be able to do certain things. So it, it was a rough, a rough year and a half. Yeah, there were moments where I thought, hey girl, what, what did you do to yourself? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, because pursuing one's goals and dreams is never easy. And I generally say that the path that you are purposed to be on is generally the hardest path. It's generally the one where it, it seems like everything is trying to stop you. Um, so during that time, here you are, like you said, people are trying to stop you from becoming, from, you know, from not acting anymore. You're going through this intense year and a half where you're just like, did I make the right decision? Am I going to be able to do this? Just to confirm, when you went to New York Academy and you studied, um, was that before this year or it, it was during okay this so year or when was this so how it happened was there was this one show that I was on the, where they had written me in for quite a long time and at that point I had decided okay that's it I'm done with acting and so I resigned and they asked me to stay on for a couple more months um you know so that they could write me out um so there I negotiated that okay cool I'll I'll stay for those couple of months but you have to give me director training so so that was the sort of first bite right and then I used that money to to go and do the filmmaking course and then after the filmmaking course I then came to to, to work full-on as as a director I think after that I only did like one acting job a year um, so it kind of over overlapped it kind of overlapped but 
let me say that that hardcore year and a half, uh, I did I did the course before that at New York Film Academy. Yeah. And now mentally, how did you survive that year and a half? A lot of people could have dropped out, dropped out in a sense like they could have gone back to acting. They could have said, you know what, this is this is a whole year and a half is not. It's not a small amount of time. That's a long amount of time to constantly be, you know, kind of knocking at a door and trying to break it or break down a wall. What did you do or what helped you get through that time mentally? Or, you know, some people would exercise, some people would rethink what worked for you. Okay, so how, how I survived that, that first year and a half is tears. <laughs> I mean, there were days where I would, I would go to the to the bathroom just to go and cry a bit between between scenes right but there were also very supportive people you know the older actors who are accomplished the ones that you are so scared to be on set with because they are award-winning they've done international work i mean it's just so intimidating they they are the ones that were extremely supportive um so so that that kept me going and, you know, there'd also be crew members who would be like, okay, I know what you're trying to achieve. Um, I've, I've got you, you know. So there'd be half and half. Like some crew members are, are acting weird, but then others, you know, they, they, they have you. They have your back. But I'm also stubborn. Like I, I was just, I refused to be bullied. Um, it, I just thought, no, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. There aren't a bunch of individuals who are going to decide whether I should have a right to do something or not. I'm, I'm not going to be bullied. Um, and I prayed. I prayed about the jobs that I got. I prayed about being a director. So it's between me and God, you know. My success and failure is going to be between me and God, not, not bullies. <laughs> it's just not going to work like that yeah so what was the breakthrough moment what happened after that year and a half that just solidified things i was good man <laughs> my work was good you can't deny talent <laughs> so wait so were you working on a project and then that pro is that your first project that you worked on no i, I did i yeah so there was there were some small gigs in the beginning uh, like short films and things, and then there was a long-running um, soap. And then while I was doing that soap, I did um, a documentary series called Women on Sex, which I put on YouTube, um, which was covered quite favorably. It's, a, it's black women speaking about um, sex, you know, uh, the politics of sex. Yeah. So I, I, I was never really only ever doing one thing at a time but as you know when you stick to your guns and you you know what you're doing and the people start to trust you you know um the work starts to speak for itself and then it's like but the work is speaking for itself you know <laughs> you can't you can't you can't deny man and you even you as the person who is you know meeting these obstacles you have to tell yourself that you have to say no i'm good i mean i remember this one time i was passing by the edit um and i was looking at this one episode that was being they were doing sound mixing on it and then i was thinking wow if i can just get to this director's level you know um i would have reached uh my milestone for the year you know, because I give myself annual mile year, uh, milestones that I have to reach this level of, of skill by this point. And then as I was watching, I realized it's my episode. It's, it's my work, you know. I needed that distance to not see that it's my work so that I don't judge it because I'm, I'm quite harsh on myself. But just those moments of watching an episode and not realizing it's my work and thinking, if I can get to that level. And I'm like, damn, that's my episode, you know. So after that, I was cocky. Uh, I was just cocky, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there's nothing better than a creative fully loving their work because we're so critical of what we do because we always have the bigger picture in mind. We always know that we want to reach like 
10,000 steps ahead of sometimes what we're creating. So when, like you said, that moment of like, no, wait, this is, this is my work. This is me. Um, I think that is amazing. <laughs> so when, yeah, yeah. so now the groom's prints, um, the, the in the timeline. Price. Oh, sorry. The, 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 okay. Yes. When the timeline did this, it must be me because I, I type badly. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, where, when the timeline did it feature in? After this year and a half? Like, where in the timeline was it? Yeah, so this is after that, that, that year and a half, right? Um, so I left my, my, steady, my steady job, my steady directing job. Um, to go do oh, wait. freelance. So wait, you were directing for a production company? Yes. I was directing for, a, so the long-term job, I was directing for a production company. It was a, a soap opera. Um, and before that, I was doing short films also for a production company for straight-to-TV straight to TV films. So, yeah, I, I left the, the steady the steady job uh, to go and do more freelance work. And that's when I did uh, the groom's prize. So talk to me about, um, cause you are writer director on the groom's prize. Talk to me about that project because apparently it was like what really launched things also for you. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to, to say this was the moment that launched, you know, it, cause Things just kind of bled into each other. But um, so this film was the first one that I, I wrote. Um, it was my first published writing, right? Because you can write all these scripts, but if it hasn't been produced yet, it, your work hasn't been published as a writer. Um, so there was this um, NFVF female filmmaker slate uh, that, that happens through one of our government institutions. Um, you know, so you, you write a short story, you pitch, you get selected and you go through this entire program. Um, so, so it came out of that. Um, so it was one of those things that had to, that's supposed to be like an empowerment, uh, an empowerment initiative. So when three films, um, out of that, that group, uh, did really, really well, the, the top one was the Virgin Vegan. I think it did over 5 million then mine, the groom's prize, um, over four million, and another one called, um, I think it's guns and guns and pearls, guns and oh, I don't want to mess up the name, but um, it was done by Mbali um, that did I think over three million, if I remember correctly. So it was quite an interesting uh, moment, you know, to be able to to reach those numbers coming out of a a sort of empowerment initiative yeah that would be an incredible boost to one's ego or career because those are some i mean millions is not small numbers <laughs> how did you feel after that moment hearing the numbers and seeing the performance of what you've created which sometimes these initiatives as great as they are sometimes the expectation of of output is not as high you know, they're like, oh, this is great. You know, yeah, let's give this, you know, support. But to have such yeah. incredible output, how did that feel? Like, what was going through your mind? Look, it, it felt validating because, you know, earlier we spoke about as a creative, you, you have a voice, you have what you want to say and what you want to talk about, right? It, it, it felt validating because I think technically and aesthetically, it needed a lot of work. Um, I mean, you can see it's an amateur film, right? But in terms of what I wanted to say, I felt validated that I could create feminist content that could be, that could reach that much support. Because, you know, you, you get told, you know, people don't want to watch that sort of thing. People don't want to have those types of conversations. Um, so I, I felt validated that I can be myself and do the kind of stories that I believe in and it still translates commercially so that was it, it was validating in those ways and I think that's important you know very very important 
So now, when did you create your own production company? I, I created my production company a long time ago, um, 2008. At the time when I was creating it, uh, it was kind of like a, a fashion slash uh, film workshop company because I, I had just transitioned from this thing of, 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 of the fashion world, right? Um, I did it then because I, 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 wa I wanted to give myself an opportunity to do independent work. Uh, the very first film that I tried to produce way back then, I mean, it was a complete disaster, complete failure. I lost a lot of money. I owed a lot of people a lot of money for a long time. But that was my film school before film school. <laughs> you know, um, I learned the hard way. Um, yeah, so, so that's the story of that. <laughs> and, you know, lessons are always learned towards, you know, with one's journey. And when it comes to the industry, the media industry, the creative industry, and finance, sometimes it seems like those two just, they don't really meet up. So for you, what were some of the financial lessons that you learned and some of the things that you realized that, you know what, I need to have these things in place financially um, as a creative? So it, it, it kind of went twofold, right? The, the creative elements were weak. So there was always going to be a financial crisis at some point, the way I see it. Um, the script was weak uh, and I, I, I kind of went into it with a lot of naivety. So it, it was bound to crash. But the financial lessons that I learned were, A, um, you know, having money to do something doesn't mean that the thing is good, right? You have to take yourself through those paces of saying, is this quality? You know those things that when you go to pitch at a production company or to a financial institution and the questions that they ask you and you just roll your eyes because you're thinking, you just know your thing is going to be good. Okay, <laughs> you may go through that experience. So I, I went and raised the money through a youth um, a youth uh, funding institution. In fact, a youth financing institution, it was a loan. So because it was functioning as a, as a loan, they, there were creative questions they didn't ask, right? Um, they just asked business questions. Um, so, so, so the two didn't meet, right? And I, I paid, uh, the way I managed the money um, I should have finished the product first before I paid people. So I, I kind of paid people in certain milestones, but the product was not complete. And when it was complete, it was too weak for me to sell anywhere, to do anything with it, to kind of recoup the money. So I ended up having to pay back the loan, pay back the people that I was still owing, even though I was sitting with this product that was bad. And I got scammed in the process. You know, one of the business partners stole a lot of money. Um, yeah, and there was, and there was nothing um, legally I could do about it at the time because of how the contracts were structured, things like that. So it was, it was a serious learning curve, how to do contracts, how to raise your own money, um, how to do business partnerships, and... You know, if, if I had a good film in the end, I would have been able to salvage that money, but I had a bad film in the end. So the creative aspect of things also matters. Yeah. So from that experience to where you are now, what are some of the key financial things, just lessons that you're like, okay, these are the things that from that experience I've taken, from my journey I've learned so that now I am more knowledgeable and I can make wiser decisions. Yeah, I mean, I think because I've managed to raise and produce stuff since then, I, I do think I manage money really well now. Um, I, haven't had, I haven't had the same issue as before. With that said, um, you, you know, if, if, if you just look at the whole story of how films work 
it, it can take a long time before you recoup the money, right? And it's always a risk, even in the successful countries where they make, you know, the most amazing mills, if you, uh, millions from these films. If you look at the sheer volume of the work that they create and how many of them tank and how many of them succeed, you know, and even some of those that tank may be actually good films, but the distribution channels or the, the appetite at the time it doesn't work out. So it's not always, um, I, I want it to be clear that it's not always a reflection of something bad that the filmmaker did if, if things don't work out financially. Um, it, it, it's a risky business. I think that's why it's so difficult to get it funded in the continent because it, it's a risky business, yeah. During COVID, the entertainment industry took a knock um, and Unfortunately, a lot of individual artists and creatives, that financial literacy wasn't, wasn't as strong. And so a lot of people personally took a knock. So, you know, sometimes there's financing projects and then there's livelihoods. Um, and especially when you like run your own production company or run your own business, the separation of the two needs to happen so that your personal life is safe as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is within your personal um, handling of money, what were some of the things that maybe you were taught or found worked for you? So for someone would be like, okay, cool. I need to make sure that because when I work on projects, the money comes in, I mean, it can come in so much later, having that bank of safety, like savings and things like that, really, really work and really help me out or, I don't know, doing a budget or were there some of the things that you were just like, these are just financial tools that I can't, I can't play with. I just had to have in place. Okay, so first, for me, the way I see it, I, I, I don't think people struggled purely because they, they were financially irresponsible or, you know, um, I think there are a lot of things that are a problem with the way the industry or the system works, right? So even the most successful production companies, a lot of them don't own any of their work, right? Because of how projects are commissioned and stuff like that if you're doing television, right? So let's say here COVID hits, and you know certain streaming platforms are looking for a lot of content because people are sitting at home and all of that. If you don't own your, your projects, what, what are you going to do, right? And the ways in which uh, cast and crew are paid, it, it's, it's dishonest to say people are mismanaging their money, right? Um, people are... are a lot of people are living hand to mouth in the industry. And when you talk about the creative industry, people think actors and, you know, the, the, the top line people, the creatives, they don't know how large an industry it is, the crew, um, the, the people who come in to clean the spaces, things like that. Those are all pe they, they are also in the entertainment in industry. They also count. And there is a lot of exploitation that happens in the in the industry. So I, I was looking at the conversations during the lockdown of how people should have been more responsible, people should have saved. Even the people who did save ended up running out of money simply because of how the, the yeah. stuff is structured. And the people who owned their content were able to do something with their content. I was able to sell um, some content at the beginning of 2020, the content that I do own, right? Um, and I was lucky enough to, to, to have writing work, which didn't require me to go anywhere. So some of the things came out of luck. Um, when I look at the stretch of time and my savings, I don't think realistically I would have been able to make it. We are black. We, we also have to help out in our homes. Our money is not just ours. There are people who rely on us. There are family members who call us for help. Um, so we must never forget our situation and our context within the industry. We must never forget our history as black people 
who work in this industry, we must never forget as women, we are already paid less or when our projects are taken on, they might be given an, a smaller budget. Those things count. So we are not just a bunch of people who should learn to manage their money better. You know what I mean? Those things are important to take into cognizance. No, that's... And that is my speech. I love that. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, it's incredibly eye-opening because I saw a lot of those conversations, um, like you said, during COVID. And so knowing that you've been in this industry for a while, I think you were a you're able to break it down and give insight on a fuller picture, which is, which is vital. And that was, I'm sure that's going to be a sound bite. Um, with some of the relationships you've formed with distributors, because that's what they are, TV, um, streaming, how have you found building relationships with these platforms? Is it more of just general good relationship building with individuals or is there different aspects to it as well? Look, I, I wouldn't know how to advise somebody on building relationships with distributors and all that because from what I've seen and just from the people that I know and what I know, I know it's different for everyone. The journey is different for everyone. Um, for me, okay, I'm an intense person, right? So, and, <laughs> and I'm very honest about how I feel about things. Um, especially if I think there's a chance to change something or to, to do something about it, then, then I'm going to speak and whatnot, right? So I'm, I'm not... I, I, I don't think my personality has anything to do with the relationships that I've been able to maintain. Um, once again, I think it boils down to the work. You know, there are people who will appreciate a vocal person, but there are those who want nothing to do with somebody like that. Um, but for the most part, personally, for me, it's always been the, the quality of the, of the work. Um, and fortunately, I get recommended a lot. So even when the international streamers um, come to the country, I will get the call, I'll get the email because somebody has recommended me, um, you know. So I've, I've really relied on the quality of my work um, and on being professional. So even if we have disagreements, I'm, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to show up. I'm going to deliver, you know, despite any sort of opinions that I might have about whatever we're doing. I am going to deliver the work. So I'm reliable in that sense. So I think that has been, that's been it for me. And having, having a voice. So when people are looking for a certain perspective, they know you are not going to be afraid to go in that direction. Um, so that, that's, that's what has worked for me. Um, yeah. Now, looking to the future, I actually need to clarify, Desmond is not here anymore, is your first American project that you're directing. Is that still coming up? Is that in, in production? How, where, where is it? Yeah, that's still coming up. So uh, we've already kind of started pre-production and all of those things. Uh, we'll start shooting soon. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's still coming. How are you feeling about that? <laughs> I think I'm in work mode now, right? Um, I was just speaking to the writer the other day and I was saying to her, I, I know how to like compartmentalize my brain to not think about certain things so that I don't get either too nervous or too, you know what I mean? Uh, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm in work mode at the moment. I'm zoned in on the script. Um, I'm zoned in on what needs to happen. Um, often, I'll probably feel extremely nervous once we've done the last like day of shoot. Then I'll be like, oh my word, you know? Um, so for now, I'm managing everything by just keeping focused on, on the work at hand. And I think I'm working with such a great team of people. It's, it's so enjoyable um, so far. Um, I'm really, really having, having a good time. So yeah, just good vibes right now. Nice. Are you guys filming this side to that side? 
No, we're filming, we filming that side. Um, so full US experience of on set. Yep, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's so amazing because our cinematographer, Agnes Pakosdi, is based in Berlin. The writer, um, Lindy Wes Subtle, she's um, uh, American but based in Berlin. Her mother is South African. Uh, our producer is uh, Japanese, American. So it's like these women from all around the world are going to create this amazing, coming together to create this amazing story about two amazing women. That is extremely exciting. That's like a, a, it's a whole melting pot of, of, of individuals and backgrounds to produce this one project. Can you say when it's expected to be released or is that something that's like, can't be defined until like, I don't know, shooting? Yeah, I don't think we can say yet. I mean, I know that next day we already want to be doing the festival runs. Um, okay. So I'm sure by next year we should be done. I hope by next year we'll, we'll be done. But, you know, you never know. <laughs> with, with film, um, you take it, you take it as, it as it comes. But yeah. But either way, that sounds like an extremely exciting project. So we're looking forward to that. And just to wrap things up, for those who are aspiring to be where you are today, and I'm going to change that up a little bit in terms of adding digital because our platform is very digital centered and you have a lot of like TikTokers, for example, YouTubers and digital creatives who are, they want to be directors. They want to work on these amazing productions. Um, and right now, they, they're just creating digitally. What advice would you give to someone like that? Okay, so once again, I'm just going to speak about my personal experience and then people will take from it what they take, right? Um, for me, working in the social media space has helped me um, move more into the direction of what I wanted to do on mainstream media as well. So earlier, I told you that I did um, a documentary series called women on sex, I, I released that on YouTube, right? Um, and it was able to travel around the world. I mean, it was, it, it was uh, covered by BBC, by French publications, German publications, all around the world. And these, these were people that don't know me from, you know, a bar of soap. So they judged the work on its own terms, right? But the reach was just so much wider than if I had forced to put it on the broadcaster here. So that's the role that social media played for me, right? I was also able to learn more about the audiences that are interested in that sort of work. I was able to check um, the analytics of how many views, when did people view, when did people stop watching. So it helped me uh, create better content, um, because of the tools that you're able to, to work with on social media and the immediate response that you're able to get on, on, in the digital space and on social media. Um, I also did um, a fine art exhibition. Um, I paint as well. I did an exhibition in 2018, which was extremely successful. Um, I was, it, it sold out. And I started posting those artworks on, on the social media platform. That's where that journey started for me. I've always done art, I've always painted, I've always done those things. But as soon as I put it on social media, it, it gained a different uh, trajectory from, from before. So for me as a creative, social media is invaluable. That's where I can do what I believe in. Uh, I don't have to get a yes or no first from a broadcaster. It doesn't have to be filtered through anyone. If it succeeds or if it fails, I am completely responsible for it. Um, and then I'm able to monitor it in ways that I may not be able to monitor the work that I do on mainstream media. So I think uh, it's, it's, social media is a powerful, powerful platform. Um, it has created so many uh, huge stars today that created themselves on their own terms on social media through their content. So I, I have a lot of respect for it. I do. Well, thank you so much for your time. I can't wait for this to be released and everybody to just 
hear this conversation. Um, we're also really excited for Desmond is Not Here Anymore, the short film. We're looking forward to that. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And that's it. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section down below or by tagging me on social media at Moy the A1. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And we will be back next week, Tuesday and Thursday with brand new episodes. Bye.